session today will be for about 90 minutes and then we will go into a Q&A session and by 6 p.m. we will have rounded up um, the conversation and the Q&A. Um, my name is Cecilia Akintomide and I am so excited to be a moderator uh, for this conversation today. I'm an independent director on the board of FBN Holdings PLC. I also sit on the board of regents of Covenant University, and I am a member of the independent management committee of the Niger Delta Development Commission. Before I introduce the panel members, I'd like to say a few words about WIMBIS, Women in Management, Business, and public service. WIMBIS is a nonprofit organization that has for the last 19 years implemented programs that inspire, empower, and advocate for greater representation of women in leadership positions in the public and private sector. For more information about WIMBIS, please visit the WIMBIS website, www.wimbiz.org. Then I'd like to also say a few words about WIMBoard, Women on Boards program, which was launched in November 2012 to increase the representation of women on boards. The WIMBoard Institute is designed to provide a world-class cost-effective learning hub for women in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, interested in sitting on boards or those who already have a board seat. This is WinBoard's first online program. And I would advise you to watch this space because WinBoard is rolling out a very exciting calendar for the rest of this year. So please visit the WinBiz website and look at the calendar for WIMBOARD um, for this year. Please tweet and tag us during this event on social media using the hashtag 2020 WIMBOARD webinar. On LinkedIn, um, women, we are on LinkedIn as Women in Management, Business and Public Service and on Twitter at WIMBIS. An evaluation link will be sent to you following this webinar. We will very much appreciate your feedback. Now, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And right after the introduction of the panelists, we will have a poll. Um, so to the introduction of our exciting list of panelists, and I'll be introducing them in alphabetical order. Oyeyimika Adeboye is the Managing Director of Cadbury West Africa and is a member of the Board of Directors of Cadbury Nigeria PLC and Cadbury Ghana Limited. She's also a member of the Board of Odutola Holdings Limited. Ibukun Awoshika is the Chairman Board of Directors First Bank Nigeria Limited, Nigeria's premier and most valuable banking brand. She's the founder and CEO of the Chair Center Group. Ibukun is um, can you hear me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes we, we, can. Can. we can. Okay, that's just a, a hitch. I wanted to be sure. My apologies. Ibuku Awashika, um, I'll just start again. Ibuku Awashika is the chairman, board of directors, First Bank Nigeria Limited, Nigeria's premier and most valuable banking brand. She is the founder and CEO of the Chair Center Group. Ibuku is a member of the boards of Cadbury Nigeria Limited and Convention on Business Integrity. Mitchell Alebe is the founder 
and Group Managing Director of InterSwitch, a company he conceptualized and has led since 2002. InterSwitch, under his leadership, has remarkably diversified its business, broadened distribution channels, and expanded into new markets across Africa, driving revolutionary payment innovation and social impact. He is a member of the board of directors of InterSwitch and Endeavor Nigeria. Audrey Jo Ezigo is the president Nigeria Gas Association and co-founder and deputy managing director Falcon Corporation, a leading indigenous midstream and downstream natural gas and energy services company. Audrey is a prolific writer and author of four published books. Bisilami Kora is a partner and head advisory services for KPMG Nigeria, and she also heads the financial services group for Africa. BC has provided advisory services for clients in the public and private sector across Nigeria, Africa, and globally. She's a member of the board of Lagos Business School Enterprise Development Center. You will agree with me that we have a fantastic line of panelists. These are board and corporate gurus, and they will be sharing their wisdom and their experience with us. So I'd like us very quickly to go into the poll. Um, can the secretariat bring up the poll? And we would like to know what the audience the, the audience's thoughts on how boards have performed during the COVID-19 pandemic. So did you, do you think that the boards were prepared, unprepared, were they highly intrusive boards or was it just business as usual? And then you have the option of indicating no opinion. So if we can very quickly um, take the poll, that would be great. And then we will go into um, our, our discussion with the panelists. Please remember to tweet and tag us on social media using the hashtag 2020 Wimboard webinar. And remember on LinkedIn, we're women in management, business and public service and on Twitter um, at Wimbiz. So, um, Secretariat, how are we doing on the poll? Do we have the results yet? Or am I moving too quickly? <laughs> oh my God. So, 18% believes that boards were prepared. 50% believe that boards were unprepared. 6% of us believe that the boards were highly intrusive. 10% business as usual and 17% no opinion. We will take this on board much later. So thank you very much um, for those poll results and thank you very much our audience um, for taking the poll. Now we will go into our conversation and I'd, I'd like to remind the audience, please, we would love to get your questions. So feel free, um, please, enter your questions into the Q&A box. Please do not provide questions in the chat box. We will not be looking at the chat box for our questions. Please provide questions in the Q&A box. So our dear panelists, welcome. Thank you very, very much for accepting to be part of this conversation and sharing your immense um, 
your, your immense experience with us. Um, I'd like to paras paraphrase Aristotle, who says that a wise person does not expose themselves endlessly to danger. However, it has been found that majority of corporate crises derive from issues within the organization's oversight or control and therefore preventable. We are also right in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, which is a black swan event that has morphed very quickly into a corporate, economic, and personal crisis. What then should boards do to anticipate or prevent crisis? So I would like to go to um, Ibuku Awoshika, your chairperson um, of, FB, of First Bank Nigeria Limited. So I would like to hear from you um, the perspective of a, of a chairperson, of a chairman, on what boards should do to anticipate or prevent crisis. Ibuku. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecilia. I hope you can hear me very well. We can hear you clearly. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to Wimbase for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar. Now, when you have a black swan event, um, it doesn't matter how much you think you're prepared for it. I think um, there's a level of unpreparedness that is uh, a part of it. And when you understand the role of um, the board and the management, ultimate responsibility and liability lies with the board, but that responsibility or that uh, power is delegated to management to run an organization on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. And I believe that in a situation around a table in a boardroom, you have multiple talents that are gathered in the interest of the organization to use their talent to serve the organization in its best interest. So in a situation of crisis, you would hope that uh, before the crisis, there would be some discernment of a trend or an emerging trend that will cause the board to Act. And usually the action of the board would be in asking executive management to present a possible plan of action to respond to whatever the situation. And everybody on this platform generally is uh, used to scenario planning. And what you can do in an anticipated situation is to have different scenarios that prepare you for how you will respond depending on how uh, it plays out eventually. I mean, if you take uh, this pandemic, for instance, even as you started hearing um, about what was going on in China, I think a lot of people thought, oh, this is not good, but I'm not sure that everybody could imagine where we are now in many ways. And so you sort of, anticipated something could happen, you start taking some simple steps, but as it sort of uh, increases and you can see the danger of what is emerging, at that point, your responsibility would be to push even further, to have a definite plan of action that is put in place by management under the leadership of the board and when things happen, that's the plan that you expect will be followed. And I think this uh, situation has not been different. If I take First Bank as an example, I think, um, especially when you have businesses across different climes, what I believe our management has done efficiently is to uh, prepare for what the response will be in the different scenarios and all of that. And over the last few months, different parts of those scenarios have emerged. And um, the board has continued to work because you cannot stop working, especially in a fast moving 
situation. And that's got to be part of how the flexibility to respond in a crisis must be there. The unity of purpose between the board and management to not lose sight of what is important and to stay focused on the plan and to support uh, for the board to give management the necessary support to act as is necessary. That is something that you cannot uh, but um, set up in order for, because the speed of response is important mm. to your ability to succeed in a situation. Yeah. So if you have a disconnect or you don't have the necessary uh, enablement for the different parts to respond, then you create a bottleneck. It's not a time for bureaucracy. It's a time where you empower the system to work. You know, okay. And that is something that needs to work well between the board and management uh, in a time of crisis without losing the overall oversight, which the board has a responsibility to account for. Thank you very much. And, and I really um, appreciated, you know, some of the things you've raised about the importance of um, discernment and watching trends and then diversity of the board, having different talents and also having um, scenario planning, having um, a crisis management plan that you have rehearsed. Thank you very much. And then from a chairperson of the board, I would like to move to the CEOs that we have um, with us today. So Oya Yimika, would you um, please share with us that perspective from the CEO on what boards should be doing to anticipate or prevent crisis? Actually, good, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Wimbies, for um, having me on this. And you know, being part of this is quite um, interesting, exciting for me. I appreciate this. Um, Mrs. Awoshika has said almost everything I wanted to say about what the CEO <laughs> expects. Because the reality is that, you know, sitting on a board, and by the way, she sits on our board at Cadbury as well, um, sitting on a board, most, almost everything she said is what we expect. First of all, the diversity of the board is very important. If you have a board that isn't diverse, you run a risk of being able to handle things when they hit you. Um, for us at Cadbury, it's been really uh, beneficial for us to have a diverse board. But secondly, as you probably uh, might know, uh, the chairman of Cadbury Nigeria, Atedo Peterside, also has set up a COVID think tank. And that has been something that's been good for us to tap into. Well, straight to your question, but, Diversity of the board is the first thing that's so, so important. Um, the second thing for us as CEO, for me, as, let, me, let, me let me speak for myself, because uh, <laughs> I can only do that. I think the most important thing is to have a board that's available. Um, you know, I can call, reach everyone at any time I want. And my board has been fantastic at that. Every board member um, has been literally on, available for, for, for advice, for direction, for support. Uh, the second thing is to get their perspective. Because of the diversity of the board, each board member has a different, literally a different perspective. Sometimes, you know, the same, but you will pick up things that are different from where they're coming from and from what their background is. And uh, that's very, very important. As I said, you know, uh, you know, at the beginning of all this uh, COVID situation, the reality is for us, it wasn't a massive shock. As a multinational, we have, uh, we had probably a first-hand experience from our business in China. And the first thing the global company did was to ensure that we all started taking learnings and prepping for what happened in China. What we could not predict is how Nigeria would handle it as a government and the things that the government of Nigeria would put in place to enable us to, to react the way that China reacted to its own uh, um, uh, uh, pandemic. Um, so from that angle, there, there, there's a bit of a difference on how you handle things, but from a board perspective, um, I think just the diversity of the board being available for us, being supportive, you know, when we need them to, to support us has, has, is really what you need. And that has been very helpful for, for our business. Great. Thank you very much. I mean, one, one of the things that you talked about that also Ibuku mentioned is that uh, being proactive. You see a situation happening in another um, in, in another environment, you don't wait until it happens in your environment. You actually start planning scenarios 
and and um, taking action. Um, I'd like to um, also get the views of Audrey um, on on the same question: um, what boards can do to anticipate or prevent crisis. Hey, thanks, Cecilia. So just to add to the two perspectives that have been shared, which in my view are extremely robust, is the fact that, you know, I, I want to take it from the poll results that said that about 50% um, of boards were unprepared. And I don't think that that should be surprising because I personally feel that on a global scale, most nations were not even prepared. So it's good to hear the perspectives of the multinationals who like a Cadbury that had the advantage of looking at what happened in China and being able to quickly think about how it could play out in Nigeria. But the reality is that most of us were kind of more reactive. And this is a big learning point from the point of view of um, the board. Board is very key in terms of long-term strategic thinking, in terms of um, shaping the risk appetite and framework for the company and so on. So when you look at the different plans that are usually put in place by any company, whether it's in terms of your emergency response, business continuity, crisis management plans, and the rest of that, um, I, I really have taken some time to reflect and realize most of us didn't factor in the kind of situation we're in now. And most boards were not thinking that there could come a time when your entire um, global logistics, your supply chains, and all those critical levers to your business were grossly impacted. So it's a huge learning, certainly that we must think beyond the um, proverbial micro and macro issues. We really have to begin to look at the world we're in now where there's a possibility for a global event, black swan type thinking, and how it can impact um, on the business sustainability. And of course, the issue of partnership, I think is really critical. Um, both Mrs. Awoshika and, um, and uh, Mrs. Adeboe have spoken to this to say that this is a time where there is need for a deeper level of handshake between the executive management and the board. This is not a time to step back and be waiting for the quarterly meetings because literally the landscape is still evolving as we watch it. So being able to, to work in partnership without getting into where you are effectively um, in executive management, but there's really need for a much closer interaction, bringing your 360 thinking from your various um, perspectives to the fore to see how to better position the company for the future. Yeah. Thank you very much, Audrey. Um, and Mitchell, um, if you could also share your views on the conversation, what boards can do to prevent and anticipate Prices. Thank you. Uh, Mitchell? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I, I think everything that has been said so far is um, very much in line with my thinking. However, I think there are one or two things I'd just like to chip in. I think first is the fact that the board takes a long term view. Um, of, the, of the business. So we typically plan our business for, for seasons. Okay? Now, yeah. In between seasons, a lot of things can happen. And the way I try, my board looks at this is to say, what exactly is the mission? Okay? So imagine you're flying a plane and you want to get a particular destination. A lot of things can happen in between. But you don't change course until there's a major event. And so what we try to do in the case of interest, which is that we have a very clear vision of where we are going. And this is usually captured in what the board likes to call a landing zone. And it is well defined. It says, by this time in the future, we would like to be valued this way. Our revenues or EBITDA, as the case may be, will be something in this range. And then the question that comes up next is, what are those triggers? that can help us get to that zone that we, where we want to land? And what are the traps that we need to be conscious of? When things like that, you don't usually recognize what kind of black swan events can take place, but you do understand that there are traps. So in the case of interest, for example, we track four things, okay? That we know could potentially disrupt our business. One of them is what are called organizational dysfunction. The second one is only has major market changes. The third one is 
technology laggard or solution failure. And the fourth one is poor business practices. The interesting thing about COVID-19 is that it hit all four at the same time. Okay. And the impact clearly was major. However, yeah. because these are things we track from time to time, it was not something we did not quite envisage. And so mm -hmm. we're able to begin to navigate the business in a way that we can cope with the current situation. So while it is true that we did not envisage this, but the way it has turned out is such that working with the board, we were not totally unprepared. Okay, mm -hmm. and we're able to recognize the impact this could have on the business, and basically move the business in a manner that we can continue to ensure that the services we want to provide to our customers, we're able to provide. Thank you very much. Um, I, you know, you and Audrey talked about this, um, highlighted the importance of long term thinking and also. Um, the scenarios, and, and you highlighted the fact um, also the importance of clarity of vision and mission and your strategy, and what are the risks you actually face, and working out those scenarios ahead of time, rehearsing those scenarios. So I'd like to um, sort of tweak the question for. BC Lamikora, coming from KPMG, um, you have provided uh, you know, advisory services to various clients. You've helped clients develop their crisis management plans. And, and we've heard each of the different um, speakers talk about the importance of scenario planning. So there are these different plans, uh, uh, a crisis management plan, a business continuity plan, uh, as well as a risk management plan. In your response on what boards should do, um, BC, to prevent as well as anticipate crisis, I'd like you to talk about the different plans and also what boards should be doing to make sure that they actually um, get the assurance of the value of those plans. Um, BC? Um, BC, can you hear us? Um, okay, looks like... Uh, no, I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. I thought Secretary was going to do the work for me, which oh. was on me. <laughs> so that's where it is. So good afternoon, yeah. everybody. I think, you know, first to say, I just wanted to, you know, acknowledge the work that Wims is doing and the Wind Board. And there have been loads of webinars, but very few of them. I think the emphasis and the focus on governance has been on their weight. That's the word to use just given the importance of governance in dealing with a crisis. I think that's what's key. And let me just go to, because I think everybody's talked about it in terms of, and they leave it on a day-to-day -day basis. We all leave it in terms of crisis and managing crisis and the process of doing that. I, I listened to a uh, sermon recently, and I think it sums up maybe very eloquently what this is all about. It says, you can do two things. You can respond or you can react. And there's a big difference in responding and reacting. And it's important that we understand that. So what every organization wants is when you're in a crisis, you are responding. You are, you know, most of what you're doing is weighted to responding rather than reacting. So the, yes, there are various plans and there are various structures that you can put in place. And I'll just spend the time to talk a bit about those various structures because it's so important because everybody knows that let's have a plan. The question is, how robust is that plan? What's the thinking that has gone into that plan? What scenarios have we created? So Michelle mentioned that, you know, it looked at it is the four kind of risk they identi identified. And what has happened now is that everything has come to play at once in this one situation. So the question is how robust, 
what are the things that we think about that are important? Now, the umbrella body for thinking about your risk is what we call enterprise risk management. So what that does is that it's the umbrella, it's everything. It's thinking through what are the possible risks to my business? And as we think through that, we also then say, what's the likelihood of occurrence of those events? What's the probability of occurrence? And then what mitigating strategies do we need to put in place? And I know that as we look at the audience today, the audience manage different types of businesses. So I'll just use an example. So if you're running a school, for instance, one of the things you should be thinking about on a very day-to-day -day basis is health emergencies that you may have for students. It's something you should think about. It is something that has to say, you know, I have students in my care, anything could happen. If I'm running a factory, anything could happen. I could have a fire outbreak. How do I respond to that fire outbreak? So I've just used, you know, I've sort of used very simple examples to sort of talk through. So there's what's called the enterprise risk management framework. And then that what that does is that it enables you to look at all the dimensions of risk. Now, let me underscore as I talk about this, that one of the key responsibilities of the board is the adequacy of that enterprise risk management framework. In fact, best practice would tell you that management should do theirs and the board should do their own so that they can then come together and ensure there's a completeness in thinking through the risk that the organization faces and how they respond to it. Now, there's another plan that's called a crisis management. So an event occurs and it would, it would always occur. So, you know, uh, whatever it is. So the crisis management plan details very clearly, what do you do in the first few hours? If I have a fire outbreak, what do I do in the very first few hours? It's focused on how do I react in the very first few hours? And as you think about it, you need to think, say, there may be regulatory issues, there may be customer issues, there may be staff issues. So what do I do immediately? There's a crisis. And that's what's called a crisis management plan. The other plan that we then have is a business continuity plan. So the crisis enterprise risk looks at what can happen. How do I respond? Crisis management says, oh, it has happened. How do I respond in the immediate? So Audrey mentioned global supply chains are cut off. What do I do in the immediate when I have that happen? My business continuity plan begins to look at how do I ensure the business is resilient? How do I ensure the business recovers? What do I do to minimize the impact on everything in my business? So from operations to stakeholders to customers, what are the things that we need to do? Now, the last plan that we'll just hear the word branded, which is very important now, is my disaster recovery plan. And it's now become important for both large and small organizations. So banks always had a disaster recovery because it's focused on technology. What happens if my servers go down? What happens if I have a fire incident and my whole server goes down? What happens if I have a cyber attack and it's a major cyber attack? that shuts down my systems. So big businesses have been primed to think about it. I think one of the things I'd like to say now is that in coping with COVID, every business has got more digital now. So it's not just for small businesses. It's for not just for big businesses, it's for the small business. So the small business who is online, the small business who has to do a fulfillment online. And I'll give an example, you know, I. Obviously, we've all been doing a bit more procurement online. So I did something two weeks ago, and then I found out I'd paid, and I had to be chasing. I had to go and call somebody to say, who owns this business? I haven't heard from her. She's taking my money. And I then got the person's number, and then I talked to the person. And you know what it was? It was just as simple that her email was not working. You can't afford that. Because you know what it was? Immediately... I was thinking of the reputation of the business. Immediately I was thinking, how do I blacklist this business? Mm -hmm. So you can understand that all these things are extremely important in terms of your enterprise risk, your crisis management, your disaster business continuity plan and your disaster recovery plan. Thank you very, very much. And 
on that, I mean, I, I just love the way you've set up the importance of, of those plans. Um, first, your enterprise risk management plan and the framework and the, and the fact that the board should develop its own and management should develop their own. I mean, that is, um, uh, that's a great insight you've shared with us and that this is looking at what can happen. And then we have the um, crisis management plan, which looks at what has happened when the disaster happens, what do you do in the immediate? And then the business continuity plan, which looks at how you ensure your business resilience and your dis disaster recovery plan, which focuses on bringing your technology um, back online if there's been uh, a cyber failure. Thank you for that clarity um, in, in, in the way you've set this out. And now, so we've talked about what you should do to prevent and anticipate a crisis. And, you know, it's great to be able to rehearse. It's great to be able to have those plans. But yes, you've been hit by a crisis. What do you do now? You're in the crisis. So what would characterize um, a board that is effectively managing a crisis? And, and can the secretariat at this time bring up again the results of the poll? Because I, I think it, it, it would help us again um, to look at those results. Um, so it, it, from the results again, a lot of the audience believed, so 18% of the audience were of the view that boards were prepared in the heat of this COVID-19 crisis. 50% though, believe that boards were unprepared. And 6% actually felt they had, as they say, trigger happy boards. They were highly intrusive. And then 10% of the opinion that it was business as usual um, for most for, for boards. And then 17% um, were of no opinion. But really 50% are of the view that boards were um, unprepared. And we have to make sure that by the next crisis, our boards are better informed and better prepared. So what should characterize um, a board that is effectively managing a crisis? Um, so let me start from the CEOs uh, because you are fighting the fires and you're also board members. So I'd like to start from the CEOs. What should characterize a board that is effectively managing a crisis compared to the business as usual board. Um, can we start with you, Audrey? Okay, thank you, Cecilia, great question. So like you pointed out, we're in the crisis and then what are the expectations from the board? I think that um, first and foremost, you don't want your board to miss the fact that yes, they are trying to ensure the interests of the company are, are protected, but they still have that fiduciary responsibility to protect the shareholders as well. That said, you, the CEO, um, and I think I speak particularly as a founder, as an owner manager, you know, there's, there is a way people, people tend to, everybody has expectations of you, I should say. And literally during a crisis, everybody's thinking on their feet. And so you find that um, sometimes it's overwhelming, sometimes it's draining. And so you really need your board to help you get out of the bubble of the firefighting that happens day to day and keep you focused on the strategic. I think that's really key. And that's why I mentioned earlier that there is need for a closer handshake, closer interactions. You want to be able to engage your chairman, um, especially more, and she or he should be able to help you, you know, focus your thinking from the point of view of where the business needs to go. I think that the board still needs to help um, ensure that management, because I know that many a time we have boards where we're always trying to give the more positive picture to the board, right? In terms of our ability to handle things, you need a board that is able to interrogate issues 
and do a deep drill, deep, um, a proper drill down. And this is one of the reasons why even in setting up your board in the first place is really important. The kinds of people that you put on the board, you must have critical thinkers and you must have independent thinkers and you must have people who can challenge your views and whose views you will then respect. Now, if you've already set that up, at this point in time, it's a firmer handshake. It's more interactions on and offline. And, you know, really just helping you look at um, both the micro and macro issues, thinking out of the box, especially, like I said, when you're having to grapple with day-to-day -day and a lot of demands from you. So I think that having a board that helps you to process uh, the risk, the way risk can play out, the way the uncertainties can play out is really critical at this time. And then working closer with management to um, fashion out effective strategies just to get through this difficult period and be sure that sustainably so we continue to run and grow the business. Thank you very much. I think it, it, it's really interesting that how you constitute your board, the talent mm. you bring um, onto that board now becomes one of the success factors when you're in a crisis. And, and thank you very much um, for, for pointing that out. Also, um, it, it's great the way you set things out that, you know, the board needs to help the CEO to go from the daily fires to still keeping the strategic focus in mind. That is a critical deliverable of the board. And then you talked about agility, um, being able to think fast and also availability, the importance of that partnership between the board and management. So you, you better have a good relationship prior to the crisis, uh, because that's part of the success factor when you're in the crisis. Um, uh, and Mitchell uh, would love to hear your views also on the perspective of the CEO on um, an effective board um, during a crisis. Okay, thank you. I think in addition to what uh, Audrey has said, I think I would like to bring the issue of perspectives. So you've got this board made up of people with diverse backgrounds, experiences, and so on and so forth. What happens when there's a crisis? Typically, what you would like to get is uh, different perspectives, experience that they've had before on how to deal with this particular issue, especially as it affects the external environment. So most CEOs tend to be in control of what happens within the organization because they know that that's what they do day to day. However, whenever there's a crisis, it usually worries them from the point of view of the external. What is happening out there and what kind of impact will that have on the organization? So I think having a board that can bring different perspectives to bear in time of crisis is, in my view, extremely critical. The fact that you know somebody tells you, we have done this before, when this happens somewhere as society was treated, gives the CEO a lot of confidence. So having a very supportive board that brings different perspectives to bear uh, that they can put at the disposal of the CEO, in my view, is extremely critical. This is in addition to the points that Audrey already made. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Um, bringing different perspectives and having a supportive board. And, and, and again, this goes into really, uh, I, I would say, the, the science of having the right persons on your board um, in, in the beginning. It's not about a group of friends coming together. It's about critical talents being brought together um, for um, critical valuable talents being brought together. So I, I'd like to hear also from you, um, Oyeyimika, so uh, Audrey and Mitchell have said two critical things that are very important. Uh, the first is about the, the composition of your board. And again, I'll go a little bit uh, specific to my board and say that we are fortunate to have a very mixed and diverse board. And that has been fantastic in terms of helping to, to manage this crisis. So, you know, not, not to get too specific, but in terms of the composition of the board, having two bank chairmen on my board, you know, is, is one thing that has been really helpful. Having a strategist, having a business owner, having a CFO, having someone with a commercial background, having someone with a technical background, they all have come in with different perspectives. 
But more importantly is what we've done before this crisis, which is how we manage our business from the board side. We, we, our business continuity plan, which is a very detailed plan, um, is shared with the board, not shared as in just for the information, but we prepare one as management and we hand it over to the board. And they spend quite a long time going through it and coming back through it, questions at us to test sense and check it that it can work if there is a crisis in reality. We also do a business risk review with the board where we look at all manner of risks that could happen. So there are two different documents and two different plans. And again, the board goes through this, you know, and because they've all asked questions and check what we're doing, when something like this comes, which you could never have predicted. I mean, if somebody said to me, list all the risks you would have as a business, I definitely will not risk that add COVID to the risk list. It's, you know, I mean, I would, if somebody said to me it could happen, I'll say never, impossible. But here we are. But what did, we, what did we do with the document? There were still quite a lot of things that were valid with that plan. And the board had the confidence in us to say, you know, we know what you have there. We know what you need to do. Just, you know, roll back and dial back to us when you need us. And like I said earlier on, um, access to the board 24 seven with no complaints at all. I, I mean, it's amazing. Sometimes I would call and I would say, oh, is this a good time? And I get a whisper like, I'm in a meeting. Can you call me back in two minutes or I'll call you back in five minutes? It's, it just gives you that confidence that somebody out there is going to call you back to give you advice or reassure you that, look, all is well, all is okay. Um, that is That for me is part of what works in, in this particular situation with the board. Great. I mean, one consistent, um, uh, one consistent thing that all of you CEOs have brought up is the importance of having a supportive board, um, a supportive board, as well as a board that is available. Um, that and 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 then I like the fact that um, all three of you raised the importance of the playbook. So if you have plans that have been rehearsed ahead of time, plans that have been critically and robustly reviewed, then even in a black swan event, you have certain processes already in place that um, can be followed. And, and so these plans remain important and should be rehearsed because you will rely on them, whether it's an anticipated crisis or it's a black swan event. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to come to the chairperson of the board, um, Ibuku. And so we've heard the CEOs. Um, now from the perspective of the chairperson, how do you ensure that your board is an effective board that will rise to occasion when there's a crisis? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Akitomdo. Now, the, <clears throat> I think the most important thing Okay, looks like um, the line is, it's frozen. Um, maybe very quickly, let's go to BC Lamikora until we can um, sort out this technical hitch. Uh, BC, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yeah, so can you keep in while we sort out the technical hitch? Um, okay. So if you can talk about an effective board when managing a crisis. Okay, I, I'll touch on, and I think some points have been raised um, in answering this question that is important. I just want to retreat it because for a board to be effective in managing a crisis, it meant that the board, it was an effective board. It meant that there are two dimensions to it. There's the dimension of what we may call the quality of the board, what we may call the diversity of the board, which is the point that has been made. The fact that the board members are available, so they haven't overstretched themselves and they have effectively are able to commit the time, focus, and passion to the organization um, is extremely important. 
I think the other one that's key is that it's also having a board that is in harmony. So it's not dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Now, what you don't want is you don't want a head mentality in a board. And I think it's important to emphasize that, that when you say um, it's in harmony, you don't want head mentality. You don't want chumminess that doesn't allow board members to think independently, to challenge themselves and therefore challenge management. So I think that's important. I think the second bit that is key when you talk about the foundation are the structures you have, and it's extremely important. So what are my corporate governance structures? How do I measure the effectiveness of the board? I was listening to a webinar not too long ago and a CEO of a big multinational was saying if he has a stay weak issue with his board, it's how does he weed out non-effective board members? How does he go about it? So it is important that you have processes that ensure, yes, you've selected the good individuals, they'll bring the independence, but the structures then enable them to operate in the most efficient manner. So your structures around you know, the responsibility of the board, the structures around the charter of the board, we're talking about crisis today. What's the role of the board in crisis management? I mean, it's one of the things that need to be defined proactively. How does the board interact with management when there's a crisis? So when I looked at the survey, one of the points that people said was that, you know, maybe the board was too intrusive. That itself can be a problem. So achieving that right balance of supporting management, co coaching management, asking the right questions is extremely important in terms of what we say. So I think there's a lot of work that has to be done to make sure you have an effective board before you have a crisis. And that's what then comes through when you have a crisis because the elements of having good quality people, just to summarize it, and the elements of having structures and practices that then allow you to trigger actions or to govern in a manner that there's a structure is extremely important. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and, and I'd like to um, come to Ibuku Awashika. I think we've been able to fix the technical hitch. Um, so we'll still like to also hear your perspective um, from um, the, the view of a chairperson of a board. Hello, Ibuku. Can you hear us? Okay, so um, we're still trying to fix um, that issue. Now, I'd, I'd like to do a, um, a, a quick comeback on, on an issue. Um, sometimes in, in, in having role plays in managing a crisis, some say you sit um, that crisis management within one of the standing committees of the board. Another um, school of thought is you create a crisis management committee that is crisis specific. I um, would like to hear your views on, on, on that. Um, BC? Okay, I was wondering, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me, let me put it this way, because um, organizations are different human beings. So there are always guidances that are like a best practice based on experience, but everything has to be put in the context of what works for the organization. Typically, what we see is when you have strong management, crisis management is the role of the executive. They should set up the crisis management team. They should deal with the issues that come up in the immediate in terms of a crisis. What the board should do is ensure that one, there is a crisis management team. The board should ensure that in terms of the actions or the scenarios or the risk that, or actually, let me just say the issues that may arise have all been thought about extremely properly. That really should be the role of the board. I, I want to use an example which is a bit you know, extreme, but I think sort of drives home some of the things the board should focus on. 
when you have the crisis, which I said executive should deal with, one of the things the board should be focused on is the executive itself. What if something happens to the executive? What is our trigger plan? What do we do? Now, there is something called in the US called designated survivor. So we talk about these things and they look as if they're extreme. It's also something that's on Netflix. But really what it is, because it exists in reality, is saying if anything happened to the entire US cabinet, if anything happened to the entire legislation, who is going to take leadership of the country? And they have somebody they call a designated survivor. So if you have a big event, so like the State of the Union, that person will not be there physically. Now, it may seem extreme because when you hear the pandemic, you know, I know we've been talking about black swan, whatever. Some people will tell you, well, it's a white swan because it was predictable based on some particular factors, but it's neither here nor there. But the point is that we have to think about those extreme situations. So they did it because of the Cold War. And when there was a Cold War, you know, anything could have happened. And I, I use that as an analogy as to what should the board focus on? The board really needs to focus on the robustness of the thinking. Do we have the structures in place? What if the scenarios, do I have an executive team that will be in place that would respond to the issues that we have? And I think that's the, really the role. So day-to-day -day crisis management has, I think, has to be the role of the executive. Fantastic. Um, I, I, I'd like to go, <laughs> you know, we have, um, most people talk about different roles based on gender. But one thing we have observed is that when it comes to founders, it does not matter whether you're male or female. Founders have a maternal instinct. They want to protect their baby, that organization that they have founded. So we have two founders um, that are speakers today, uh, Mitchell and Audrey. So I'd like to find, I'd like to hear from the founders. Um, how do you ensure that your passion to protect your baby does not get in the way of the board's exercise of its oversight responsibilities, particularly in a crisis. So um, Mitchell, Audrey, uh, would like to hear from you. So Mitchell, do you want to go first? Okay. okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, for me, I've only seen myself as a founder, CEO that can be fired if uh, I don't do a good job. And so it's very clear to me what my brief is. Um, being a founder, uh, you're just the one who came up with the initiative. Um, there are others who have invested time and resources into the business. Huh? You're only useful as a founder, CEO, if you can deliver the results that are expected. And so if you have that at the back of your mind, the will just slightly. You basically see yourself as a CEO who has taken its, uh, its authority uh, from the board and you're accountable to the board, not yourself. And therefore, the key deliverables that must be met, uh, you must meet them, okay? So when there's a crisis, the ultimate goal should be how do we steer this organization to overcome this crisis and ensure that post the crisis, the business continues to do well. There's no ego involved. And so wherever you can get help from the board or anywhere possible, you have to remain focused on that and ensure that you're able to take the organization to where it should get to and hope that uh, post the crisis, you can look back and say, well, we did a good job and everybody's proud. Great. Um, I, I like the fact that you highlighted that you are not indispensable. The fact that you're a founder um, doesn't mean you cannot be um, disengaged from the company as CEO um, and that you still remain accountable to the board. So it's great that you're the founder, but you have to keep it in mind that yes, 
you have that founder instinct, which gives you the drive um, to do a lot of the things that you do as CEO, but you still remain accountable um, to the board. And I'd like to hear from Audrey, another founder that we have in a lineup of speakers. So Audrey. Yeah, Cecilia, so Mitchell actually just hit the nail on the head. Here's the thing, as founders of businesses, you know, we are, we're like a double, it's a plus and a minus, let me put it like that. There's the plus because we're coming with the strength, we've put our blood, our sweat, our tears into growing the business, right? And we're very passionate about it and we're willing to go every extra mile that is hopefully legal and ethical. And so sometimes you find yourself in a position where the board looks like they're constraining that entrepreneurial drive in you. However, just like a mother naturally looks out for what is in the best interest of her baby, the best kinds of founders that I see and that I hope and believe that I am are those ones that recognize that at some point we may not be the best person for the role. And so we're willing to step out. And I always say to entrepreneurs that you must be confident that you're running the business so well that you can't be fired. And if you can't say that, you really need to step aside. So when you look at your board in the first place, and you ask yourself, why did I set up this board? What are my expectations? Especially as your business is growing, becoming more complex, more sophisticated, you know, a bit more global and certainly more intricate to manage. You really need a very strong board to set the pace. You, you, you get part where you wake up at night and have a brilliant idea and you want to change everything the very next day. So if you recognize this, then you know that you must submit to your board. And you know, another thing I always like to encourage is the thinking that you, when I'm talking about succession in my company, for instance, I'm not looking for a company where it must be my son or my daughter that is coming to take over. I'm looking for where I've built such an institution, like a first bank, for instance, that has been here for how many years? And all you would say is that there was some one Audrey Joy Zibo somewhere that started this company that today is a global brand. If you recognize this, then you are less um, antagonistic to your board and you are more submissive to their direction. That's what they're there for in the first place. I believe that as a CEO, as a founder of a business, if you set up a board that you cannot respect their directives, one, you are sh certainly shortchanging your business and quite certainly you are shortchanging yourself. And maybe it's just time to step aside. Founding means you build things. If you're an entrepreneur, you build things. If you have built something up to a certain point and you're now finding yourself always having issues with your board because of the direction they feel the business may need to go. It's either the board needs to go, which I suspect is not the case. Most likely you just need to go and start something else and let someone more competent than you take on that role because you must be able to recognize when it's time to step out and let other people grow your vision to heights that you can't. So I think it's, it's a conflict situation that is real, but depending on the perspective, the perspective that the CEO, the founder has about this business, this baby that they've birthed, they will always allow for the best decision to prevail. Yeah, thanks, Cecilia. Thank you very, very much. I mean, uh, I, I love the fact that you highlighted that succession planning doesn't have to be um, biological. Um, and, and that is something that one needs to, to, to highlight. Um, I think we've, we've been able to fix the hit. And so I'll still like to come back to um, Ibuku Awoshika on what she sees a critical for a chairperson to ensure that you have an effective board managing a crisis. Um, yeah, obviously, heard. yeah, I just unmuted myself. Sorry. Oh, My apologies. I had a hitch and then I couldn't get back in. The system wanted yes. me to fill some long okay. form. But you know, we so it. want to, we so want to hear your view. So <laughs> okay. we had to work out that technical hitch. Okay. So by um what I was trying to explain is look, one of the most important service that um a company can do for itself is to constitute the right board from the onset. Unfortunately for us in this environment, there is quite a bit of challenge with that, especially because I also want us to respond to the kind of audience that we have. 
the audience we have, everybody is not from a multinational or from large corporations. We have a lot of small and medium sized companies and you want them to understand the factors that are at play. It's not about having your husband, your cousin, your uncle, your friend on the board. For every seat that is occupied at your table, you must know exactly why that person is there. You must know the strength that they bring and you must know the service you expect from them uh, for that company. And the time you get to test if you have done a good job of that is when you have a crisis. Because if you are a CEO, I, I listen to what Audrey and um, Mitchell said. If you are a CEO that is uh, a ghost stick or just wants to be an all in all, well, you will get an all in all problem situation in a moment like this all by yourself because you'll have a board that is just cosmetic and cannot add any value to you. But if you've done a good job of actually bringing people that you will listen to, that's for owner managers because I'm also a founder and an owner manager of the chair yeah. center group. I, I sit on both sides uh, uh, of the field. If you don't create the right board, you lose that value that they can bring because of course, you know, as our people say, two heads are better than one and nothing better than five heads, seven heads or nine heads that have different experiences, different exposure, different network that they all bring to play. And even if you're like someone is, if I'm on the board of Cadbury as I am, and I learn something from there, it can impact the decisions I would make at the chair center group because the um, practices, the exposure, the knowledge that comes from the, the global company in terms of how the play will affect the value that I or any other director that I have who brings different other knowledge in will deliver to the company. So that's really important. Now on the side of um, the chair, what is the responsibility, uh, responsibility of the chair of the board? It's really, you're, you're like first amongst equals because around the table of a board, you're all equals in a sense, but someone is the captain of the ship. And what is the role? The best captains are the ones who are able to tease out the most value out of all the members of their team so that they can achieve the vision and the goal that the company has set for itself. And therefore, having the team between the non-executive directors and the executive directors that form uh, the key part of management who then drive the entire team of the organization, working together with mutual respect for the role of each part of the one. Because they do have different roles, but there must be harmony of both roles in order for that uh, organization to get the best value from uh, all the directors. And that's really how a company can, by um, taking all the value from all its players, and making them work together to achieve the goal, that's how it can work in the interest of the organization, no matter what the season is. Even if you've missed it, like a lot of companies can tell you, this is what we're doing and all of that now. But the reality is, as the poll showed you, the largest number of companies were not prepared. A lot of people thought it was so far away. It's not gonna get here. They didn't, couldn't see that it would impact the entire world. But when it did, the important thing is now you're in the middle of it, what do you do? How do you respond? What are the plans? How do you work together to achieve the results that you see? Ultimately, what is the goal? To keep the business going and to make the business profitable and deliver value to all your shareholders and your stakeholders. So if you can achieve that working together, then you have the right team on both sides. Thank you very much. I mean, that is so apt. And, and, and really this, um, what you highlighted that every seat in that board must have a value add. It must be a defined value add. And, and, and also the role of the chairperson being able to tease out the most value from all the members of the board so that as a collective, they are really bringing value to the board and, and working in harmony. Thank you very much. Now, you know, you, 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 you highlighted 
um, the importance of the collective. And, and when we look at a board, we focus on that collective. Um, I, I'd like to hear from BC, how, what should, the collective is great, but really it's the individual board members. And, and like Ibuku said, every seat on that board must have a defined value add. So what are the sort of skills that individual board members should develop or should already have so that they bring value add in the event of a crisis? So, um, BC, would you like to um, say a few words on that? Sure. Let, let, me, let me start it off. I think the first thing to say is that you want a board that's experienced when you have a crisis. And I believe Michelle referred to that earlier. You actually want a board that has seen crisis in the past. I think it's either Michelle or you. Because you need that experience. Um, for management. So you want a board who, in a sense, as we'll say, has lived through this before and can then bring the experience from the past to be able to say, one, have we thought of everything? In terms of our reaction, is our reaction complete? So when you say, have you thought of everything? Have we thought about our regulators, how they will react? Have we thought, thought about how the customers will react? Have we thought about what is key to our staff? So experience is number one, and it is key. I think number two is that you need your board, and it has been mentioned by the CEOs earlier. You see, when you're in a crisis, management is focused on almost the things that are in front of them, the issues that are in front of them. And remember, those issues are always multifaceted, and they're rapid when you're in a crisis. So the focus is on those multifacets, on responding extremely, you know, being very responsive and responding fast, as you would say. So you actually also need a board that has strategic thinkers. The board that's also looking at after this crisis, what are we about? Um, I think Michelle used the word, you know, it's a helicopter. We know where we're going to. What we don't know is the turbulence that will meet a lot, you know, as we're joining in that helicopter. So you need a board that keeps you on that long-term destination. That's so important. So the board is able to keep you on that long-term destination is extremely important. I'll say the third one that's important in terms of the quality and the composition of your board is also the ability to manage stakeholders. So when you have a crisis, there are typically several stakeholders that need to be managed. There is your regulator, there's the government, there, you know, there are various people who, your bankers, and you need your board to be able to help you manage those stakeholders effectively. So that, you know, in terms of the reaction. I think the other thing which I'll end up is that you need a board who really holds you accountable to your values as a company. Because when you have a crisis, it's easy to forget the things that are true and the things that are important. So every action has to be in light of what are my values. If my people are first, then I be, have to take those short-term decisions that then ensure that I have put my people first. If the quality of what I deliver to my customers is what's important, I have to say, yes, there have been supply chain issues, but I'm not going to have any shortcuts. I'm going to have to maintain that quality because the crisis will pass. My customers will remain and they'll remember how I was treated through a crisis. So that's extremely important. So I've talked about experience, managing stakeholders, you know, the ability to keep management focused on the long term and the long term vision is extremely important in terms of what you want from the board or what's the qualities that you want to see from the board um, at this time. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone that wants to contribute to this on um, what you would want from individual board members before we move on to the next um, theme for our discussion? Okay, um, Cecilia, if, if I, yeah. what I'd like to say is, you know, at the point of crisis, sometimes yeah. 
their surprises around the table. But you know, we said at the beginning, at the point that you're appointing people, you must have a sense of the value that you're bringing them on for. But sometimes there's a lot of latent value that you, mm. you do not know about until you walk into a crisis. Mm. Either experiences they've had that nobody's um, aware of one way or the other, networks that they have that you don't even know anything about, which brings out the factor of trust mm. at the table. Because if there is um, a common trust and respect for one another at the table, in the middle of a crisis, people are going to throw a lot of things on the table as tools or ideas that you should apply. In a number of cases, you might not necessarily have enough time for your normal diligence that will be required. And this is what BC was saying about experience counts for a lot. The team building within that board and mutual trust and respect for one another will come into play. Your ability, and some of it will be, you would get some of it wrong in the middle of, I mean, you want to minimize that, but reality is some of the things you will try out with the best of intention will not work out. But it shouldn't, you shouldn't end up then turning that into a blaming game and all of that because there's mutual trust of intent of every person at the table. And having, building that harmony, building that trust and being able to extract whatever value, known or unknown, from everybody in the middle of a crisis would be key. And, and that's really what makes the chair of the board is like the conductor of the orchestra. And at that point, there can be divergence of opinions between directors and management. And somehow you must find a way to bring everybody together so that the focus is on the company and its interest and the goals that must be achieved. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, I, I you know, technology, has been the light in, in the current COVID-19 crisis. And, and I'd like to hear from two of our speakers, one that's a tech expert and a CEO that's had to rely on technology. So um, I'd, I'd like to hear from Mitchell and Oye Yimika. So Mitchell, what has been your experience and what's the advice you would give to boards on the importance of investments in technology? Um, Mitchell? Yeah, thank you very much. So first, I think technology is an enabler for any business. Uh, I just cannot imagine any business today that can say they can thrive without having appropriate technology in place. But having said that, uh, there's a lot of changes happening within technology itself. And the business has to keep abreast of those changes. Sometimes you're unable to afford them. Uh, sometimes you can't move as fast as you should, but it's something I believe most businesses must do. You must find out what are those technologies that helps you to get an advantage. And this advantage is something you must sustain. So from the sustainability point of view, there, there are various kinds of technologies that a business must have. Now, if you take the specific case of interest switch, uh, we basically had to make two major changes because of COVID-19. We've always had collaboration tools, for example, uh, but these tools were designed to work within the organization, not from home. So the moment we are forced to work from home, we had to take a look at our technology again, and we realized that it was not optimal for working from home. So we basically had to sunset two of them and move to two new ones that we felt uh, could be more effective. Another area to look at is most people today would like to interact with the organization using technology. So the kind of channels is also very critical and how they can provide feedback to you when they use those channels also is something companies must take a look at. I'm aware of one or two organizations that prior to now had said their business model was not to trade online. And they were in the retail business. 
So you can imagine COVID-19 happening and most of your competitors were able to continue to engage their customers right from the comfort of their home. People could make orders online and they could be delivered to them. And then all of a sudden you realize that you are a business that ever invested in taking your business online for customers to interact with you. And throughout this period of COVID, you suddenly realize that you have zero sales. If you're a member of a board that runs this kind of company, it would be a very embarrassing situation that your organization in today's day and age um, did not see the need to leverage technology appropriately. So I believe that technology is here to stay for most companies. Um, there are different, different price points. Not every organization can leverage technology in the same manner. It's something that I believe people should not shy from. And it's an area I think bots uh, must take an interest in. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I, I, you've highlighted tech is a, technology is an enabler and you really need to identify the technology that helps you to get an advantage. And you just have to be on the ball. And I like the fact that you highlighted that it's not just management's problem when um, a company is behind the curve when it comes to technology, it's a boom also. So Oya um would love to get your views. So a CEO that's not a techie, but you've had to rely on technology. Um, Oya Yimika would love to hear from you. Hello. Hi, technology was about to fill me there, so I had to quickly find joining up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, two things quickly. Uh, looks like I'm running down on battery power, but two things quickly. Uh, first of all, um, as a global company, we, we've been fortunate to have a tool that we use anyway because you know we work remotely. Um, having a region office in Singapore, my business unit is being managed from South Africa, and my boss is currently in Australia. Um, so, you know, three time zones um, needing to connect and having been doing that, not just myself, but the entire organization, various people have various reporting lines. Uh, but in addition to that, and probably more importantly, is the ability for the teams to work from home um, and for us to support them by providing the cost because they have the tools, uh, because that is the work tool we use anyway. It's just that people are now having to work from home and not using the server in the office not using the Wi-Fi in the office and, and that sort of thing. So in terms of working from home for employees, we, we, you know, we're on course. I think where we had to quickly change things is actually our business itself in terms of commerce and trade. And, you know, Mitchell mentioned that. So, you know, for our business, fast moving consumer goods, Nigerians like open markets. So literally 80% of my sales comes from open markets across the country. Um, Okari, um, uh, Aba market, Onisha market, that's where people trade. Uh, with the markets closed, we had to quickly switch to retail. Now, in all fairness, again, the learnings from China prepped us a little bit. But, you know, unlike China, where the open market is 25%, for us in Nigeria, it's 80%, almost 80%. How do we switch quickly to make sure that I don't lose 80% of my revenue? Uh, it's going into retail, going into neighborhood, enhancing our uh, footprint across the retail space and making sure that we're there. Uh, jumping into telesales, I mean, the, the commercial team were extremely um, agile in this and just trying new things with no fear for failure because it's really, it's switching quickly and doing something differently or missing out completely. So the quick switch was there as well for the team. And that honestly really helped us in terms of picking up at least some of the sales that we could have lost. So telesales, um, e-commerce, all of that came in into being, and even our customers, we're switching to that. You know, we had orders coming in from WhatsApp and we had to then, you know, translate that into our SAP system because they didn't know how to do it from, you know, a person that's used to sending an, a, an email from their store in Worry now wants to order but doesn't have the tool to do so. So you get an order on WhatsApp and you say, well, I can't accept your order on WhatsApp because I can't connect WhatsApp to SAP, um, you know, and then we had to quickly think out of the box. How do we do this? Um, and in all fairness, our governments have been very fantastic. You know, they allowed what they call essential right. services like us. They allowed us to, to, yeah. to operate. So sh shipping the goods was not the problem. It's 
getting the orders, putting it in, and then being able to reach customers uh, as quickly as possible in, you know, in, a, in a situation. Technology honestly has helped us in this. It's helped us to think out of the box as well. And you know, some of the things that we put down as post-COVID action plan, we're picking them all up now and putting them in our playbook for post-COVID. Fantastic. And, and talking about post-COVID um, action plans, um, we, we're now going to round up this session and we'll just like to get you know, um, words of wisdom, particularly on the post-crisis role of boards. Um, so you've, you've said it, uh, post-COVID um, action plan. So maybe we'll start with you, um, Oya Yimika. Um, what do you see as the post-crisis role of boards? I think, you know, first of all, it's, we, we will have a post-mortem session. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, either virtually or, or to, to, together. We already are putting together uh, documents on what we've learned and, you know, what's working, what's not working, and essentially what our action plan against what's working and what lessons have we learned. You know, so it's to, to dial back to the board and say, look, we had a BCP and something totally different hit us. This is what yeah. we've learned. From this, and this is our proposed action plan. And then to get the collective experience from our boards. I mean, like I said, we've been very fortunate to have someone who set up a COVID think tank um, as our chairman. So, I mean, there's a wealth of experience from what he's learned from, from his uh, space and what he's doing. Um, plus, you know, looking at the rest of our board, each owning their businesses, the strategy person, the, the two bank chairmen, so much resource that we're going to take together and use um, as a tool for the future. Probably something else might come up later, God forbid, that is similar to this, but at least, you know, we've learned our lessons and we can take from that and, you know, talk about what's the worst case scenario, what, what could be worse than this? And what should we do if the whole world is on lockdown and we're all sitting at home and we still have businesses to run or, and we have a business to run? What should we do to, to, to recover? You know, those are the things that we would obviously be talking about, you know, when we do our, our regroup uh, with the board. Thank you very much. So you don't get out of a crisis and say, thank you, Lord. Now let's keep on moving. You need to focus on that post-mortem and lessons yeah. learned from the crisis. It's no longer business uh, as usual, Celia. It's no longer business as usual. That is it. Um, Audrey, uh, would you like to say a few words on this? Right. I just want to agree with uh, Moya Yimika on, on what she said, that as companies, we're clearly going to be rethinking our, our policies, processes, looking at our plans again. You know, everybody's now putting a pandemic adjustment to <laughs> everything we had laid down. And um, there's going to be a need for the board to step up a bit more post pandemic to, to now look at what are the lessons learned look at how they're interacting with um, executive management, look at what kinds of even technologies and trainings that may be needed to enhance uh, delivery, both for the board and for executive management. Um, I think that is a time when even as individual board members, each one like um, Ms. Dawishka pointed out that each seat is supposed to bring value to the table. So quite frankly, even as yeah. individual board members, everyone has to do like an independent self-assessment and be, ask, be asking themselves, mm -hmm. what have I taken out of this and what am I bringing to the table going forward? And quite frankly, if you, if you are really just not the person, maybe be bold enough to start um, stepping away from that. But I think everyone is going to have to rethink the business landscape. We're going to have to implement um, or rather constitutes plans to address this kind of crisis going forward, even though we hope it never comes to the fore. But I also want to quickly say something about the, um, the owner managers. I like to talk about that because I am one and I know how, how we get around the things that we build, that for those who may have boards who they feel have not delivered or don't have the capacity to deliver, then this is the best time to rethink what it is that they need from the board. And I'm not saying disband your board, I'm just saying that there may be need for, uh, part of your lessons learned will be also bringing everybody back to the table to say, you know what guys, going forward, this is what we need to deliver. And whatever- Disband support, where you need to disband. I'm getting there, ma'am. <laughs> I wanted to say that there is a process. So first and foremost, and I've talked about this before, if you are an owner manager, look at your board, ask yourself, are they the right people? 
if they're the right people, but you haven't engaged well, you need to redo that. If they're not the right people, certainly there are no emotions about this, right? They are none whatsoever. We have to do what is right for the business and you will do yourself a disservice if you have an ineffective board and you continue to run with them post-crisis. Thank you very much. I love the independent self-assessment. And I think every board member is hearing that. It's not just about us assessing management. Let's assess ourselves as directors and see whether we actually rose up to the occasion or we need to enhance our value on that board. Ibuku Awashika, I would love to hear from you. I can tell um, there, are, um, there are insights you want to share with us. Thank you very much, Audrey. Thank you. I think uh, a number of things have already been said, no point repeating. But one of the things, you know, as I listen to yeah. Audrey and to uh, Yimika, is that you would realize that as Yimika narrated how Cadbury um, walk through the challenges of the season. And she talked about being able to take orders from WhatsApp that's not integrated into their SAP system. And if you know them very well, they're very prim and proper and follow all the letter all the way back to the head office in America where it is. Anyway, what it shows you is the type of people that we need in organizations more than ever this period exposed the kind of minds that need to be leading organizations, whether mm. from the board or from management. Mm. First, the enterprise, the entrepreneurial mindset has become extremely important. Whether in the life of an entrepreneur building a business or in the life of an entrepreneur within a business, yeah. the flexibility of mind to think outside of the box, to operate outside of the box, to be quick to make necessary changes without being tied to bureaucracy or this is how we've always done it in a situation that requires to throw everything down and reset is really critical. And you will find that there, I'm sure when, as we go through all the post there will be many companies that will have reports about how their system was their biggest handicap, how yeah. they were unable to respond to the changes that were required simply because either you had a fixed mindset CEO, a very um, narrow-minded board, or individuals that were at critical junctions within the organization that could not think outside of the box in order to move it forward. And that's important for all of us as entrepreneurs that we must never forget to continue to remain entrepreneurs, no matter what size or scale our business becomes. And that even as we work or run multinationals, that entrepreneurial mindset and that liberty and flexibility to respond to situations must never be lost within an organization. We don't know what's ahead of us tomorrow. So. That would be my biggest mm. learning. Thank you. Thank you very much for those words of wisdom. Um, having the flexibility of mind um, and, and knowing when to actually come out of the well laid out processes to be responsive. I think that is, is critical. Um, Mitchell, uh, would you like to add um, a few words as we wrap up on post-crisis role of the boards? Yes, I think there are two experiences you should expect to see from boards. Yeah. So first, don't forget COVID-19, though a crisis could have been a positive trigger for certain organizations. Whereas for others, it was a negative trap. If COVID-19 was a trigger, a positive trigger for a business, that means that during this period, that business boomed compared to the past. Naturally, mm -hmm. the board will be looking for how do we ensure we continue to ride on this boom that we experienced during COVID-19, during this crisis, after the crisis. Yeah. And if it is a company that was impacted negatively, the challenge the board will be facing is, thank God this period is over. Now, can we get back to the way we were before and continue to sustain growth? 
So it is important, therefore, that boards begin to ask themselves, how has the current crisis really affected the business? What are those things that happen that we wish we could keep and continue to make them? What are those things that have happened that could impact, that impacted us negatively, but somehow we are happy we're out of the crisis now. I want to show that we can continue to sustain the business. So I think boards will fall into these two categories and the outlook will be slightly different depending on which side of the fence the board belongs to. Thank you very, very much. And BC, uh, just before we go into Q&A, would you like to say a few words on the post-crisis role of boards? I think most of the, I mean, Yimika started with the debrief, which is extremely important. Yeah. Um, as you started to talk about, you know, we now need to say, um, and which, you know, I think Bicha said is, what, what happens to the business after? Because the business landscape has changed. And some of those changes are permanent changes. So there are permanent changes around virtual working, permanent changes around the board working on a virtual basis. You know, there was a banter yeah. between uh, Ibuko and um, Yimika when we started, but those things are, they are permanent changes because we've actually found out that it's more efficient and you know, it's more yeah. effective. So I think it's important that the businesses begin to think about what are those permanent changes and how does it impact their strategy? Adoption of digital is permanent and that's clear. And you know, we're not gonna see that change. But the last thing I would like to say, you know, cause just going back to risk management, you know, when you do risk management, you start with a known unknown. So you start yeah. with a known event, but you don't know when it would occur or the magnitude of which it would occur. I think mm -hmm. one of the things this reminds us of, I think it's Donald Rumsfeld that said it after 9-11. Yes. The unknown on is extremely yeah. important. So when these things happen, it should begin to stretch us and should stretch the board to then focus on the unknown unknown. Yes. Thank you very much. And 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 the if it sounds crazy to say it, but the beauty of a crisis is that an unknown unknown is unveiled and becomes unknown. Um, and, and that's why really you cannot um, walk away from the crisis doing and returning to business as usual. You have not incorporated those lessons learned. We've, this has just been a fantastic um, session. I have learned so much. I've made notes for myself. Um, I can't thank um, the panelists enough, and I've been reading the comments that's been coming from the audience. I mean, this is a fantastic audience that have stayed a part of um, the, the conversation. So I'd like to go into Q&A. We've got like 50 questions um, from the audience. Um, so, Well, I think quite a lot of the questions actually um, relate to how you constitute a board um, and the types of competences that you should be looking for. So clearly um, the audience wants, wants us to drill down on specific competences. And as you know, Wimboard also is helping women, um, preparing women for boards. So it's not surprising that there's a, quite a lot of questions on, on specific competences. Um, will um, Ibuku Awashika like to say a few words on that? I missed it. If you just- Okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, um, the audience would like us to do a deeper dive on competences for board members and what boards okay. will be looking for um, when they are um, identifying potential board members. Okay, I, I get the question now. Well, okay. it's different for different. There's some things that are common and standard. Yes. Depending on the particular industry, 
there are specific things that you should be looking for. Uh, experience, general business or career experience, corporate experience or enterprise experience in building a business would be key over time because there are a lot of learnings that you can then uh, bring to the table in terms of that. It's absolutely essential that you understand financial records. You must be able to read accounts. Mm. So I'm not saying you should be an accountant, but yes. you must understand what a balance sheet is. You must know what uh, the profit and loss, what it means. You must be able to look at the financial statements and understand what it means because numbers are not numbers. When you're looking at them, they speak, they tell you a story and you must yeah. be able to understand what story the numbers are saying to you. You don't have to be a specialist, but you must have a basic understanding of uh, those things. You must have um, good human relationship skills yeah. and uh, a good respect for other people. Why is that important? Around the table, there are diverse kinds of people. The ideal board should be quite diverse in talents, in nature, in character, hopefully not in integrity and the substance of your character, but you will find that um, some people can be annoying, some can drive you off the walls just because they're slow at speaking, some are fast at speaking, some are loud, some are quiet, and the loudest people are not necessarily the smartest, and the most quiet people are not the dumbest, they just don't make as much noise. And you have to have the capacity to accommodate other people and have respect for other people's opinion because you won't always agree with the voices around the table. And you must have that skill to listen to people, to look at it from their view, even as you express your own view. You must have the discipline to keep to the rules in some sense. Hmm. Hello. Um, it appears we may Hello? We can hear you. Hello? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can um, hear you. It appears that um, Ibuka Woshika got frozen, um, but I'd like to hear from Mitchell. Um, one of the questions asked was whether, and, and actually this will go to all of you, did you observe any gaps? Um, during the COVID-19 crisis, did you think that there were certain um, competences that were missing around the boardroom or even just missing around senior management? Um, is there anyone that had that observation? Can you hear me? Sorry. Y yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, 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 yes, we can now, and we were just oh. asking whether, for on giving the importance of constituting the right talent on the board, um, did any of you observe any competency gaps um, during in the heat of the COVID crisis, or really um, it was a confirmation that the right talent was around the board's table? And I think that's, I think that's a question you're not likely to get a uh, public <laughs> answer to from anyone in terms of their, their own board. That would be a matter for the board to deal with in terms of um, whatever they have realized, if that is true or not. But it would be a disservice if the um, organization oh, yeah. does not go through that process. But in, in, in reality, Certain institutions already have that matter covered because like on our board, every year you have an independent assessment of the directors. 
you get to evaluate their role, their contribution, yeah. and their value add every year. And that report comes okay. to the chair of the board, yeah. and then you have a conversation with each director in terms of where their gaps are. And then you make a plan in terms of how to improve them to fill that gap. And where you feel that over time, okay. you're not, you still have some gaps and you're not getting the result, is either you bring certain people on to fill the gaps or you exit some people in order to, where you don't have room for additional and you feel value is no longer being delivered. You make changes. You, you're always reconstituting a board anyway. You need a refresh sometimes yeah. in order to change how things are because the skills you require change from time to time. As of three years ago or four years ago, having someone with serious tech or digital knowledge on a board for a bank was not a major part of it. But as digitalization came into the financial services industry, that became key. Having someone that has um, um, what did I, digital security and all of that knowledge, those are major parts yeah. of what you do now. So the cons your board that was good five years ago is not necessarily good now. So you need to always have the liberty yeah. to create a new mix in order to achieve what is in the interest of the institution and your shareholders and all your stakeholders, which should always be the paramount thing I would consider. Thank you very much. So there's a question for both Oyayimika and Mitchell. So crisis has happened and all of the wonderful plans and playbooks that a company should have, you don't have them. How, what, what advice do you, would you give to that type of management and the board? They are right in the heat of the crisis, but they don't have the playbooks. So who will go first, Mitchell or Yayimika? <laughs> well, I'll go first. I think okay. um, if you don't have it, you need to start to get it, throw it away from okay. it. Uh, I think there are people like uh, BC that can assist. Uh, they have playbooks that are well-defined that can assist you with getting them on board quickly. Uh, I think that's the best advice I can give. If you don't have it, you just have to get it. You can't run away from it. Thank you very much. Very pragmatic. Um, Oya Yimika, and would I would like say, to say a few words on this. Say in the interim, while you're doing that, please think out of the box and start, get off your feet get as much done as quickly as possible. You really have to think out of the box and, and work as you go. Um, you would be in a firefighting mode. So you need to get all the help you can get and do things quickly. Thank you very much. Um, there are quite a, a lot of um, questions. Um, there, there's a question specifically for you, um, Yimika, on the impact um, the crisis has had on your production lines and how you've been able to make changes um, to those production lines, given the COVID um, protocols and, and need to protect staff. And, and was there a role for your board in, in, in coming up with, with the adjustments to your production line? Thank you. Um, just quickly, because I know we're running out of time. We didn't have to make any adjustment to our production lines because um, most of our lines are updated anyway. Um, I think what we needed to focus on was more on the people, getting them to work safely and keeping them safe. So we did things like hiring bus mm -hmm. staff buses um, to various locations in Lagos to make sure that people got to work safely during the lockdown, particularly when we had the full lockdown in Lagos. Um, that was really what we did on, on the production side. Um, as I said, the board reviews our, our, our business risk profile and our BCP plan, and all of this was, we had risk anywhere around what happens if, if one, one scenario, the, the factory got blown up, you know, and we had a bomb and the whole factory got blown up. So we have a plan around that. So we, a few things that might not be ordinary, we did think of um, beforehand, so for us, the, the, the equipment was there. It's just how do we get the people in into the office, into the factory, safely? Great. Um, now, just um, from a BCP 
perspective of, or actually, let me move it away from the BCP perspective. Now, going Can we beyond always the issue, decode? Can we explain what the codes are? Because there are people oh, that yes, might just don't true. know what BCP is. Yeah, so uh, business continuity plan. Um, but I, I think we should maybe just go beyond the business continuity plan and just see during this COVID crisis, um, would any of you like to share specific engagements with your board to actually bring about a difference in your operations? Just specific, um, would anyone want to share? I think I already mentioned before the many, many phone calls to various board members around <laughs> different things that we're experiencing and the advice I got. Sometimes I'll get advice and you know, now I'm getting all public. Sometimes I'll get advice from A, but I want a second opinion. So I'll talk to B because I'm not having a board meeting and I just need to make sure that yeah. when I really decide what I want to do, I have some general consensus. Sometimes I'll send an email to everyone saying, I know we don't have a board meeting, but I just want to run this by you and I want to update you on what we're doing. Uh, so, you know, those, those were some of the things that we did uh, during this crisis. Again, technology came into play fantastically. Great. Uh, a comment around, as a board that I chair internationally, and um, the CEO and the um, CEO, both one lives in Canada, one lives in, in San Francisco. The business is all over the place, but they're headquartered in Nairobi. And once this whole crisis happened, everybody scattered, uh, scattered back to their tent. So you have people go in different directions and all of that. But you know, one of the things the CEO did that I find very effective is because he knew we couldn't have board meetings, there, were, there wasn't uh, the chance for um, a lot of engagement, but their business is quite high moving and there's a lot, a lot of moving parts. There were too many critical things going on within the period. Every week or, or every two weeks or so, he wrote a full detailed report of key business issues, key developments, their decisions, the things they're doing, all the critical moves they've made, and he would send it forward. So if you had an opinion, either to enhance, to support, or to know, you were informed. So we're about to have a board meeting or so next week, and it was easy to make the board meeting into two hours instead of four hours, uh, I chair that board and as the chair, I could say to him, you don't need four hours. We're totally aware of most things because you've kept everybody abreast of it. So assume all of that information, just give an executive summary of it and then go on to the other key things that will come from the rest of the board. So in unexpected situations, you might need to work in an, an unexpected way. And the um, approach of the CEO and the board, the way they work together will always make a difference as to how that works. Thank you very much. Um, we cannot respond to all of the questions. This has been, I would say, um, a thorough discussion. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each and every single one of our panelists. You have shared your wisdom, you've shared your experience. This has been fantastic. I have learned so much and I'm looking, I'm reading the comments from the audience and the comments from the audience has just been deeply appreciative. So I want to say thank you to each of you. Um, I also want to thank the audience. Please remember there will be an evaluation link sent to each and every one of you. We would appreciate it if you could um, complete that evaluation. And um, if you can complete that evaluation and send us your feedback. We deeply appreciate your feedback. It's the only way um, we can get better. And please visit the Wimbers website. Um, Wimboard is going to be rolling out its calendar of events and online events. So um, COVID notwithstanding, the Wimboard program is going to be rolled out and please watch that space. So from all of us at Wimbiz and Wimboard to 
all of our panelists and to members of the audience, thank you very much. We know and we're very sensitive to the fact that these are interesting times, challenging times, and we can only encourage you all, stay strong, stay safe, and God bless us all. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Ibuku. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, Bissi. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Oye Yimika. And to the fantastic Secretariat of WIMBIS, I mean, you've done a great work and kudos.